important events that would have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And I want to begin by saying good evening to all of our viewers who are joining us on television from Ahaika to West Coast Barbies in region number five. Good evening to all of our viewers across the Barbies River who are joining us on television from Mara all the way to New Amsterdam on the east bank of the Barbies River. Good evening. And to the tens of thousands who are joining us on television from Palmyra all the way to Crabwood Creek and Molson Creek. Good evening. And also to all the people at Kanji. Good evening. I know you are joining us on television for another program of issues in the news. To those of you who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, good evening and welcome to another program of issues in the news. And last but not least, to all of you who are joining us across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and as far as Australia on Facebook Live, welcome to another program of issues in the news. And as I would normally say, please press that share button on your phone so that this live feed can be shared on your wall, on your page, so that we can have the widest possible audience. Please share this program, press that share button on your phone so that we have the widest possible audience joining us tonight to discuss a wide range of important issues. So I want to begin by extending my most sincere congratulations to our students who have done exceptionally well at the CSEC and the CAPE examinations. Our students have done phenomenally well at those examinations, both at CSEC and at CAPE. And I want to salute them. I want to offer to them my warmest congratulations for what is indeed an outstanding performance. I want also to immediately recognize and salute the sacrifices that our teachers would have made in ensuring that our students give us these sterling results. I also want to recognize the efforts and sacrifices of the parents of these children and their relatives without whose help, without whose encouragement, without whose guidance, these accomplishments would not have been possible. I can't, sometimes when I look at the results, I find it extremely difficult to understand how these students are passing these numbers of subjects. 27 subjects at one sitting, 25 subjects at one sitting, 22 subjects at one sitting, and then CAPE, which is the equivalent of advanced level. One student get, gets 18 subjects, 18 grade ones, advanced level. It, I, I can't, I don't know how these subjects are fitting into a timetable having regard to the school hours or the formal school hours. These accomplishments are indeed amazing. And it goes to show the advancements that we are making in the education sector. Every year, 
I observe our students are doing better than the years before. We are spending a lot of money in the education sector. Billions are going just in grants, in cash grants. And education is receiving the highest allocation in our budgetary, in our budget, annually. And by these results, we are recognizing, you are recognizing, and our students are recognizing that the investments that we are making in this sector are yielding the requisite rewards. There is no greater investment that a government can make but in the education of its nation's children. And our government has that as the highest of priorities. And we are making those investments and we are seeing the rewards and we are showing the rewards. What is also recognizable is that 25, 30, 40 years ago, the schools in Georgetown, and a few of them only, were topping these results. Queen's College, Bishop High School, St. Stanislaus College, just to name the creme de la creme of our secondary institutions. And they used to dominate the results at these examinations. What we have been doing in government is ensuring that there is a greater equity in the distribution of our resources in this sector and in every sector, but this is the sector about which I'm speaking, so that we offer to every child as a government, irrespective of where that child is located, the best possible educational and other opportunities, or at least one that is as far as possible, similar to those that that child or a child in the urban centers would have had, would have been exposed to. And perhaps we are also seeing the results of that policy. So not that Queen's College, St. Stanislaus College, and bishops are not performing. And perhaps they are now being outperformed. But that is not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that the children of Anna Regina Multilateral School, Line Path Secondary, Tagore Memorial, and many schools outside of Georgetown are yielding results that are now surpassing or at least equivalent to the results of our children in these urban centers. And that shows that our policies are working. You see, only historically, the schools in Georgetown were not available to the poor who are living outside of Georgetown because they don't have accommodation, they don't have the wherewithal to stay in Georgetown to attend school, and some of them are unable to travel, if it is possible to travel to Georgetown on a daily basis to attend these schools. And where before it was obvious 
that these schools were reaping more of the resources than the other schools, you had a system that was not as fair as it is now, and not as equitable as it is now. Denying, perhaps, large sections of our population because of geographic location and because of affordability. With our investments in education in every geographic area of Guyana, in equal proportion, we are now seeing these schools outside of Georgetown doing as well, and in some cases even better than the Georgetown schools. It means that our education system is working and is providing the necessary resources in a fair manner to all of our students, or at least the widest cross-section of students of our country, irrespective of class, ethnicity, and geographic location. And that is what we intended to achieve. And I dare say, when one looks at the results published in the newspapers, our government is achieving that objective. So I want to also recognize the Ministry of Education and to congratulate them for the excellent job that they are doing. And of course, my colleague minister, Minister Priya Manik Chand, for being at the helm of this ministry and obviously extending to the ministry the type of leadership that brings about this type of results. So I thought that I'll specially recognize our students and all those who assisted our students in achieving the remarkable results that we are celebrating today. Some time ago, I indicated on this program that I wrote the Guyana Elections Commission requesting documents that were submitted to that commission during the national recount of the ballots at the 2020 March 2nd national and regional elections. Today, I am told that GCOM has made a decision to release those documents to me. So hopefully I'll receive those documents tomorrow and once I receive them, I will pass them on to the relevant agencies with the request that an investigation be launched to verify the accuracy or lack thereof of the information contained in those documents to inquire into who authored the documents or who authorized the issuance of the information contained in those documents. And what is amazing, I'm told, that the opposition commissioners were opposed to my request, at least initially. And these are the guys who are repeating the very allegations and are relying upon this allegation in their incredible efforts to impugn the 2020 election results. It is they who are speaking about the information in that document. And now, government has signaled an intention 
to request that document so that it can be investigated so that we can know the truth. The people are objecting. The very people who are peddling the information in that document are now objecting to the document being released so that we can investigate it. These people have ability at all. Nothing that they do make any sense to anybody. But that, that is what we have to deal with. And as I am on this issue, my attention was drawn to a statement made by opposition leader Aubrey Norton at his press conference. And this gentleman continues to amaze the population and continues to shock the conscience of this population wherever he speaks. Today, I heard him say that the voters list or the list of electors is 90% more than the voting population. The voters list, he says, is 90% over and above the voting population in the country. I don't know if this guy doesn't examine and analyze what he says or what he wants to say. I don't know if, if he don't say it and no one corrects him internally. I, I am not, I, I don't understand how an educated person can pronounce, make these type of pronouncements publicly. I had to go quickly to get some information when he said that. And I have the information on how, what the voters list numbers are for the 2011 elections, 2015 elections, and 2020 elections. Now the 2011 elections, this is an election that they want a seat over and above the PPP, the two parties. They, won, they had a one seat majority in 2011. The total electors on the list for that year was 475,496. 475,496. Total electors on the list. Total number of votes cast was 346,717. 346,717. And this is an election that they were almost, they claimed that they won. 2015, the one that they won, they claim they won, and they formed the government. 570,787 people on the list. 570,787 7, people on the list. Number of votes cast, 415,970. 415,970. Go to 2020 now. 660,998 people on the list. 660,998. Total votes cast 464,565. These, these are the numbers. And Mr. Norton is saying that the voters list has 90% more persons than the voting population. Let the statisticians and the reporters who are listening to this program make sense or nonsense of what Mr. Norton is saying. And he said that he said that 
He said in his press conference that he said this to the international community. He made that statement to the international community. Well, I'm happy because the international community will then appreciate what they're dealing with as an opposition leader. So I thought that I will deal with that. And, and there is another thing that I want to speak on quickly. They have now added to their narrative that the PPP is objecting to the removal of dead persons from the list. I repeat, they are now saying that the PPP is opposed to the removal of dead persons from the list. Let me reject that contention unreservedly. The PPP has always said that the list, persons who are on that list, must be removed based upon provisions in the law that relate to removal of persons from the list. In other words, persons must be removed from the list based upon the legal grounds for removing them from the list. Death is one of the legal grounds to remove persons from the list. We have never said that we want dead people on the list. We are asking that GCOM removes dead people from the list because that is one of the legitimate method of removing persons from the list. In fact, in the amendments that we are proposing in the electoral reforms, we will now, the amendments, make it mandatory for dead persons to be removed from the list at periodic intervals. And the, the proposed amendments specify the periodic intervals. So once every month, or once within the time specified in the amendments, there must be a collaboration between the General Registrar Office, that is the person who keeps all the death records, there must be a collaboration between that office and GCOM for the purpose of comparing records so that the voters list and the national, data, national registration database can be adjusted to reflect the removal of dead people from that database and from all electoral lists. We are putting that in the law. How will we ever say that we are opposed to the removal of dead people from the list? You have been listening to me for weeks speaking about this matter. What I have said is carried in print in permanent form by several newspapers in this country. Go back and see where I speak about this issue or I spoke about this issue and you will see that I have always said that names must be removed from the list in accordance with the law. And the law actually says that death is a ground for removal. But these guys fabricate, manufacture, and concoct stories to tell their supporters because they can't carry a straight and truthful narrative because they don't have a truthful straight narrative they lie and they play the race card and the race card when they play it is also predicated upon falsehood and falsity so that's their main two planks of political activism 
playing the race card, and then manufacture and concoct allegations that have no basis in reality and in fact. So I want to pause a little to look at your comments so that we can continue. So as I said, I am inviting you and reminding you again to share, press that share button on the phone, on your computer, so that as many of you as possible can, so that many persons as possible can join us in this discussion. These discussions are intended to provide you with information so that you do not fall prey to the misinformation that is being peddled every day by the opposition. So, and I said that I want you, want this program to be as interactive as possible. So, if you would like me to speak about an issue, please let us, let me have your views. And I would normally call some people out, but I didn't get to do it this morning, this afternoon, I forgot. So, Mohammed Zakir Yusuf, Zamal Sheikh, there's a person here by the name of Fair Politics. Henry Singh, will Alexander carry out his bluff to Sue Jack Deo? That's an interesting question. I don't know. Mr. Jack Deo's lawyer has written a four page missive to Mr. Alexander, reiterating what Mr. Jack Deo said at that press conference. Because what Mr. Jack Deo said at that press conference, in my view, is not libelous. All he did was to call upon Mr. Alexander to account. And Mr. Jagdeo was reading from documents, official documents, from the Registrar of Companies, which state that Mr. Alexander is a beneficial owner of the company. And if you're a beneficial owner of a private company and you receive hundreds of millions of dollars of public funds, any member of the public, more so a politician, is entitled to ask you questions about how you have spent the money. So we have a packed house, Robin Raj, a Balram Bhagwan Singh from New Jersey, a Gary Moore, Jack Jagdeo from Toronto, Kumar Singh, uh, Teresa Arif, Kumar Singh is asking for an update on the parking meters case. The parking meters case is ongoing at, in Washington, D.C. Um, there are procedural steps in the preparation of the arbitration, and those steps are now being taken to ready the case for the arbitration hearing. And that's where that is now. Um, so it's a work in progress. And I'll keep you updated. Now, I want to speak a little about the appointment of Chief Justice and Chancellor. Because a case has been filed by an opposition MP in which the Attorney General is sued on the ground that the President has breached the Constitution by not initiating dialogue with the Leader of the Opposition since August 2nd, 2020 in respect of securing an agreement for the appointment of the Chief Justice and Chancellor. So they have sued the government because they are claiming that President Irfan Ali has not yet, and since August the 2nd, when he took the oath of office, 
has not yet initiated a process of engagement with the leader of the opposition in order to arrive at an agreement in relation to the appointment of a Chief Justice and Chancellor substantively. As you may know, our constitution is perhaps the only one now in the world where an agreement is required to be reached between the president as head of the executive and the leader of the opposition in respect of the appointment of a chief justice and the appointment of a chancellor. In the event that an agreement is not reached, then the Constitution provides that a person can be appointed to act in either or both offices, well, in either offices, after meaningful consultation between the President and the Leader of the Opposition. So, if there is no agreement, then the President must then have meaningful consultation with the Leader of the Opposition for the appointment of someone to act in these offices. This constitutional change occurred during the constitutional reform process of 1999 to 2000. And since the change was made, we have not had an appointment. So the last appointment which took place under the pre-existing law was Chief Justice Carl Singh or Mr. Justice Carl Singh being appointed as Chief Justice and Madame Desri Bernard being appointed Chancellor. And th those two appointments were made before the Constitution was changed. So there was no need for agreements in relation to those appointments. And that was the last time that it happened. And then the change came. Since the change came, no agreement. So when President Jack Dale, these changes were since in 2001, so Mr. Jack Day was president for a number of years thereafter under the new dispens constitutional dispensation. And on many occasions, he attempted, first of all, let me say, when Chancellor Desri Bernard was elevated to the Caribbean Court of Justice, Chief, Ju Ch Chief Justice Carl Singh was appointed to act as Chancellor and Justice Ian Chang was appointed to act as Chief Justice. During that time, Justice Carl Singh was a substantive Chief Justice but was promoted to act as Chancellor and Justice of Appeal Chang was then made to act in the office of Chief Justice. That was in 2007. Thereafter, President Jack Neu attempted several times to engage leader of the opposition, Robert Corbyn, to secure an agreement to conform the two persons in office, Chancellor Singh and Chief Justice Chang. And there are several meetings that were held, several letters exchanged, and Mr. Corbyn refused to give his agreement either to confirm Chancellor Singh or to confirm Chief Justice Chang. So all efforts between Mr. Jack, President Jack Dave and Corbyn failed. President Jack Dave initiated the process 
and pursued it. But leader of the opposition, Corbyn, refused all attempts to confirm, to offer his agreement to confirm these two persons in office. That lasted until 2011, when President Ramatar assumed the presidency. I became Attorney General, and I sat in several meetings between President Ramatar and leader of the opposition, David Granger, in which President Ramatar attempted to get Pres leader of the opposition, David Granger, to agree to confirm these two persons, Chancellor Singh, Singh as Chancellor and Chang as Chief Justice. Several meetings and leader of the opposition, David Granger, refused to offer his agreement to confirm these two gentlemen who by that time would have been acting for years in those two offices. So that accounts for 2011 to 2015. Mr. Granger became president in 2015. It is the president who must do the initiation. President Granger not once ever attempted to engage leader of the opposition, Bharat Jagdeel, from 2015 to 2020 in respect of securing an agreement for the persons acting in the office of Chief Justice and the office of Chancellor. Not once did President Granger ever attempt to engage President Jack Deal, uh, leader of the opposition, Jack Deal. By that time, you had Justice Carl Singh, and you had a chancellor acting, and the Chief Justice acting, Yonet Cummings, because Ian Chang had come off the bench. And then Chancellor Carl Singh left, and Justice Yonet Cummings became acting chancellor and Justice George became acting chief justice during Mr. Granger's regime or reign as presidency. Not once did President Granger initiate an engagement with leader of the opposition, Jack Dale, to confirm any of these people in office. What President Granger attempted to do, what he attempted to do was to try to bring someone from outside of Guyana whom he intended to put to act as chancellor. And the newspaper reports are there to confirm that. He wanted to bring someone from the Caribbean instead of confirming these two people or instead of attempting to do anything in relation to these two. Now, I am not in any way saying who should or should not be confirmed. I am not, that is not my place. That is the president's business. I am not I'm making that very clear. All I am doing here is to recite the history, so that you understand the history. And now they have sued President Ali for not initiating. When PP, successive PPP presidents, starting with President Jack Dale, were trying all the years to get an agreement. And when they were in government, for that five year, they never attempted to get an agreement. Not one initiative in relation to engaging leader of the opposition, Jack Deal. 
But now they're back in opposition. They are filing proceedings against this president, who now is there. And they're accusing him of violating the Constitution because he has not yet initiated a process with the leader of the opposition. We, initiate, we initiated engagements with the leader of the opposition for the appointment of other constitutional commissions and the world saw how he misbehaved. So, and then he took us to court and the Chief Justice gave him a sound tongue lashing about his behavior and said that the president was right to ignore him at one point in time and go ahead and make the appointments because he was being obstructionist. He was being confrontational. And we won the case. The Chief Justice did not find anything wrong with the appointments. What the Chief Justice found wrong was the behavior of the leader of the opposition. His failure to make any constructive contribution to the consultative process. His failure to even provide a nominee. No basis putting, put forward for his objections. No objection putting forward. He did not put forward an objection. All he wanted was more information, more information, more information. That was what characterized his conduct in those engagements. And now they are suing us to go and engage him again. But that the engagement must take place because the Constitution requires it. But that's the president call. And the president will initiate that process at the appropriate time. And he, the president has said so. So I just thought that I'll put out there the history of the two governments' approach to the issue of conforming the chancellor, of, of, of the position of chancellor and chief justice. I just thought that I'll put it out there. People must know the history. And I hope that if the press is going to do a story on this issue, that they will quote me accurately. That I am not advocating for anyone. All I am doing, because of the case filed, I am giving the history of engagements that took place between the different presidents and the different leader of the opposition on this matter, because I believe it's a matter of national importance. So a lot of people are inquiring about the status of the Commission of Inquiry. And let me say that the preparatory works have begun and the Commission of Inquiry is well on its way. The President will speak more elaborately on this matter at the appropriate time, as it is a presidential inquiry. But a lot of people have been inquiring, and I am simply assuring that the preparatory works are being done. A lot of work has to go into preparing building, making a building, first of all, securing a building, making that building ready, securing staff, securing the materials. Those works are ongoing and public disclosures will come from the president very shortly on when the commissioners are going to be sworn. An important issue that I want to speak on, and we are really running out of time, is 
to that the special prosecutorial program which my ministry launched some time ago in collaboration with the University of Guyana, the Director of Public Prosecutions, and the Guyana Police Force is moving apace. You would recall that we created a special academic program combining several courses and asked the University of Guyana to run these courses. And we enrolled into admission some 70 odd students who possess a Bachelor of Laws degree. So that was the admission requirement, a Bachelor of Laws degree. About 50 or so of them completed the course. About 50 completed the course successfully. About 35 of them were granted scholarships. And those who were granted scholarships are now going to be inducted into the state's prosecutorial apparatus and will begin to function as prosecutors alongside police officers in the magistrate's courts across Guyana. The police prosecutors are allowed to prosecute under the Police Act. Under that act, there is a provision that says that a rank a rank not below the rank of corporal can prosecute in the magistrate's court. These persons are going to be sworn in as sergeants in the police force. And that would give them the right of audience. They will operate under the supervision, the overarching supervision of the Director of Public Prosecutions because that is the office that is constitutionally responsible for all prosecutions in the country. And they are going to be paid and agreed financial package which was discussed with them. And very shortly, they will begin a, a familiarization process within the police force to understand the operations, to understand the command structure, and to fam familiarize themselves with the workings of the police force because they are going to be members of the force, of course, only for the purpose of prosecution. And we are trying to get them permission to be attired in civilian clothes and not uniform when they are in the court. So this is a very unique process. It is an unprecedented initiative. So Every step of the way, we had to innovate and we had to break new ground. This batch is creating history. It is the first time that an initiative of this type is being launched in the Caribbean and also in the Commonwealth. I know for a fact that there are many Caribbean territories that are looking at Guyana and looking at this initiative to see whether it works 
And once it works, they will borrow our experience. In fact, I am aware that two territories have already made a decision that it is a splendid program and they have retained the same consultant that we work with to create our syllabus and our course outline and lecture notes. They have retained the services of that, that consultant to do similarly for their country. So this initiative here, I am very proud of, and I believe that it will have a tremendous impact in the quality of prosecutions that we will see taking place in the magistrates' courts of our country. So that victims of crime, the public interest, the state interest, ought to get a higher quality of representation. And I say so while I recognize the sterling performance of our police officers who have been doing this job for over a hundred years or more. They have done a remarkable job with very little time, very sparse resources, and very limited academic qualifications. And they have had to face some of the best legal minds this hemisphere has produced because Guyana has produced some of the best legal minds in this hemisphere. And these policemen had to prosecute against giants such as Geoff Haynes and Lionel Locku and Stanley Hardial and Rex McKay and do not sing, and all these, Bernard de Santos, all these legendary names. Now we are upping the ante with a batch of people who are not full-fledged lawyers, but more than halfway there. And we believe that it will lead to a qualitative and quantitatively better service for the people of our country. And it will have an impact on our crime situation. It will have an impact on our criminal justice system. We are also recruiting world-class, professionally qualified persons for our forensic lab. We have to import these skills and we are in the process of doing that. These persons will be contracted to stay in Guyana for a period and they will be required to teach while they are here. I've already begun discussions with the University of Guyana and they will also do forensic sciences, forensic medicine, ballistic, forensic photography, and all these CSI type courses. This is what we need, scientific approach to crime fighting, scientific approach to prosecution. That is where we have to take our game at the crime at the anti-crime, at the crime fighting level. Because that's the type of sophistication that the criminals have. And we have to update and upgrade the state's ability to respond. So we have to get all the modern facilities and modern skill set, technologically advanced skill sets available in the world here in Guyana. And that process has begun. 
And these initiatives to which I am making reference are part and parcel of that process of transformation. And that is how we will deal with crime and criminality in our country. From every possible angle, with emphasis on science, technology, and an empirical driven, educational driven program and pursuits. So my operator is signaling to me that we have come to program time. I think that we have covered a wide range of important topics and I think that you have had a good, we have had a good discussion. I want to thank you very much for joining me tonight. I didn't do much politics tonight, but I did a lot of public information, which I believe is important. And I want you to join me next week as we continue our discourse. And I want you to take care and enjoy the rest of this week. And of course, the rest of this evening. Thank you very much and please join us next week. May God bless you and your family. Thank you.